Hello, everybody. Welcome to Dead Reckoning TV. I'm your host, Jay Friesen. And I'm Brian Matson. And today we are very, very excited to wrap up our three-part series, Wine, Women, and Song, How the Incarnation of Jesus Changed Everything. We've been looking at uh, creational gifts in part one with Christian Kreider, followed by relationships in part two with Owen Strachan. And now we have on with us, um, it's an honor to have you here with us, uh, Jer Jerem Bars, author of Echoes of Eden, Reflections on Christianity, Literature, and the Arts, professor at Covenant Theological Seminary. It's great to have you with us, Jerem. Well, it's great to be with you. Thanks for asking me. Well, we're delighted to have you uh, on the show today. Jerem, um, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the uh, laying aside of divine prerogatives, entering into the world, taking on human flesh, it seems to me changed everything, and in particular, it seems to change stories. Uh, the Greco-Roman world, uh, if you think of hero stories, uh, is, is a very different genre than the kinds of stories that have been told ever since the incarnation and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, is, could you describe your feelings about that? Does, does Jesus change stories? Uh, he does indeed. About, it's a very interesting question. I just watched Troy the other night for the first time. And if you think about Achilles uh, as an example of a, a Greco-Roman hero, uh, one of the great heroes in Homer's uh, Iliad, it is so utterly different from anything which really comes after Jesus. And I think there are all sorts of things which are fascinating about it. For me, one of the most exciting elements of it is if you, if you think about Greek and Roman tragedy um, everything is determined by the gods you, you think of a story like like Oedipus for example or Antigone or, or any of those great Greek plays and they're really wonderful plays but in all in all of them you know, the hero or the her heroine is going to a destiny which has been prophesied for them and about which they can do absolutely nothing. You know, so Oedipus, for example, the prophecy is when he's born, he's going to murder his father and marry his mother. And everybody tries to avoid this destiny, but human choice is nothing. People are just absolutely trapped by the fates. Mm. Now, if you think uh, about tragedy after Jesus, Shakespeare obviously is the greatest tragedy and to, to ever have written and Shakespeare was a Christian and he's writing within a, a Christian understanding of reality coming after Jesus. Oh, in his tragedies the, the heroes and the villains have choices. Take Macbeth as an example. Oh, yes the, there's witches, there's a supernatural element in the story uh, but oh, it's not determined. Oh, Banquo refuses to do what, what the witches say is going to happen. Uh, Macbeth chooses to do it, and he makes a terrible choice and brings awful tragedy into his own life, to his, his wife's life, and everyone else's life. But it's a completely different kind of tragedy. And the heroes are different because there's real human significance. And so they can make choices which actually affect history. You know, God has created us in his likeness to be history makers. Hmm. And this is one of the things that's profoundly different from the Greco-Roman world. People really matter. We really have choices. And obviously, the, in terms of the kind of true heroism after Jesus, the true heroism is the heroism of, of self-sacrifice. It's not the heroism of, 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 of somebody like Achilles, um, who's, who's just a great warrior, basically. Um, uh, very self-centered guy. You know, the, the Christian, the story, the stories after Jesus are just so very different. If you think of Aragorn or Gandalf in the Lord of the Rings as examples of of heroes after the coming of Christ, uh, they're so they're so utterly different. These are people who live as servants. Yes, they have glory and power but it's exercised in such a completely different way. It strikes me um, that, that I had never thought of that point before of, 
human significance and the fact that uh, human beings have have choices and they're they have meaning and significance and it strikes me what a tremendously incarnational point that is uh, God becoming man is there any greater illustration of human significance and meaning he became a man he didn't become a, a, a a, a stone or a tree or a river. He became a human being. Um, th- that's amazing. I had I'd never thought of that. Mm. Yeah, it's a very beautiful thing that, and it gives such dignity to our lives. I mean, that's what we're celebrating at Christmas right now, that, that God, the one who, who created the whole vast universe, actually entered our life and gave extraordinary significance to it. So that ordinary life, the ordinary life you and I are living today, actually matters because of his coming because he shares our life and so you know it's a very beautiful thing and you mentioned self-sacrifice it seems to me that that's really the heart of what how stories are different after jesus it seems to me it, it seems like all great literature the stories that really resonate with us are the ones that explore that concept of self-sacrifice sacrificing for another um can is there any parallel in the ancient world, ancient Near Eastern uh, literature that you're aware of that celebrates the notion or concept of self-sacrifice? I don't think so. I mean, I, I would, I would have to go away and think about that question. <laughs> yeah. But it, it, it's, uh, you know, nobody's ever asked it, asked me it quite like that before. But I'm not familiar with anything like it. Yeah, you, you have heroes. Um, heroes who are prepared to fight the death but it's the heroism that's important again if you think of somebody like Achilles his death is noble but it's not presented in the same way that he's sacrificing himself for the sake of other people when he dies it's a terrible tragedy Um, and what he's remembered for is is not his death for other people but his exploits as a warrior uh, and that's what he's fighting for. Again, just thinking about that film, Troy, and I think it's capturing what Homer does so so powerfully in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Oh, his greatness is that he, 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 he is this extraordinary fighter. Um, or if you think of Odysseus, his greatness is he's this very clever man as well as being a great fighter. But the death of Achilles or the death of Hector in the story mm-hmm. is a terrible tragedy and n- n- nobody's drawing attention to the death in the same way that that we celebrate the death of Christ where he's giving himself up for us bearing our sin bearing our judgment oh yes the death of Christ is a tragedy but it's his greatest expression of his glory mm and of his love and so it's it's a different way of thinking about the death of a hero a completely different way uh, of thinking yeah jk rowling says in in one of the harry potter books that self-sacrificing love is the greatest power in the universe and you know that's the heart of course of all of her stories but you know i've just been teaching this class on tolkien this semester and that's that's the heart of those stories uh, and the hobbit and the lord of the rings it's this readiness to to lay your life down for other people because you love them. So, so without Jesus, we don't get Harry Potter. <laughs> well without said. Jesus, we don't get Harry Potter. That's exactly right. <laughs> it also strikes me. That's a nice yeah. line. I remember that. Word. Yeah. It also strikes me that these heroes are beset by some character flaw or defect, and it's it's a story of a great hero who ends in disgrace or humiliation or or something, some terrible thing befalls him. And then after Jesus, it seems like stories take on this kind of a different arc where there's a humiliation and then an exaltation. It almost, great stories seem to follow the, the narrative of Jesus's life work, right? His, his humiliation and exaltation. Um, have, have you noticed that about ancient literature, you know, compared comparatively to, you know, Christian literature? Yeah, that, that's that's a, that's also a very interesting question. Yes, I think that's true. I mean, and I think you you still have people who try to present Shakespeare's plays that way, as if they were really a Greek drama. And so the problem is, 
a, a fellow's jealousy or 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 Hamlet's craziness or whatever but 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 that's a profound misunderstanding of what Shakespeare is doing uh, because he's not he's not dealing with with heroes in that kind of way and the tragedies come about rather because of the brokenness of the world people's rebellion against God and their their greed their their lust for power uh, uh, whatever and so it's a it's it's a very different kind of tragedy because if you if you're going to to read Hamlet or you're going to read Macbeth what's tragic about it is the the tremendous sadness that comes into human life because of rebellion against God because of hunger for power because of murder say in the case of Macbeth uh, because of disloyalty and it's not a, a character flaw that's the problem here you know, which he's inevitably dragged down by it's something quite different it's this choice that he makes mm. he chooses evil rather than good he chooses to live for himself rather than to live for others which of course is the calling of a king now Hamlet's situation is different because it's really not an error on his part at all it's just the wickedness of the context in which he finds himself mm. where he's He's living uh, constantly in danger uh, of being put to death by his uncle who has killed his father and has seized power. And so Hamlet's just trapped by, by the wickedness of the situation in which he lives. But what's beautiful about it is even when he dies, and often these bits are left out of contemporary performances of the play, well, Hamlet dies really at peace because he knows that he's in the hands of God. And he quotes this beautiful line from the Gospels, and you don't see it in most productions of it, because Shakespeare's play is four and a half hours <laughs> long if you do the whole thing, so it's a long, long play. But there's this wonderful line where he says there's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. Mm. And then at the very end, he says to Horatio, he says, the readiness is all. You know, am I ready to die? That's the question. And to fix God, uh, and it's it's just a very beautiful thing. So, so when so when Horatio says at the end, you know, and let flights uh, flights of angels uh, sing thee to thy rest, uh, he really means it. Yeah, he merely means it. Yes, he does. Wow. Yeah, it it is it is it is a play which doesn't make any sense if you if you don't see it within a Christian context, and that's the same with Macbeth. Wow. You know, there there are productions of Macbeth which. Uh, which, which they really don't know what to do with it because if you get rid of his significance and instead you, you've got somebody who's controlled by the fates in this case by the witches if you if you saw Roman Polanski's uh, production of, of the film I'm not recommending that you do because it, it, it's just so overwhelmingly painful but there's a it, it's a very shocking thing because at the beginning of the play you see Macbeth and Banquo riding across along a road and they're riding past some rocks and there's a terrible storm and they have to shelter under the rocks and as they're sheltering they hear the witches singing and they go to find out what's happening and then the play unfolds with all these terrible things and at the very end of the play he he in the, the film Polanski puts a scene in which isn't in Shakespeare's play at all he has he has Malcolm and his brother riding along the same road and there's a terrible rainstorm and they shelter under the rocks and they hear the witches singing and what Polanski's telling us this is all going to happen again you know, human beings are just controlled by these supernatural forces of evil and trapped in this but that's that's not the play that Shakespeare wrote you know, and because it's not the play that Shakespeare wrote what you've got is a real tragedy here's this person this person who begins who, who begins you know, well you know, serving his king Duncan and honoring him and being courageous and fighting for what is good against the enemies of Scotland but then he makes a series of really wicked choices and his life comes crashing down but but he's not 
he's not forced to do that. Mm. He's not controlled by, by demonic powers. Now, you can understand why Polanski did it. When he made this film, it wasn't long after Charles Manson's group had murdered his wife, an unborn child. Mm. And Manson was deeply involved in, in really terrible demonic things. Right. And so you can understand that Polanski's approaching life with a, with a kind of desperation at this point and a deep sense of the power of evil. But, but you know, neither Charles Manson nor Macbeth were, were fated to do the things that they did. Yeah. You know, they were not controlled by the devil, thankfully. Uh, human beings actually have significance in this world. Let's talk about it. Uh, On that, I mean, just uh, let's talk about another interesting. One thing, other thing I wanted to add oh, yes, there was ahead. that we, we actually had several of Charles Manson's followers who came to stay with us at Labrie wow. and were converted, uh, you know, who came to faith in Christ and whose lives utterly changed. Wow. Wow. Let's talk about another interest of yours, and that is Tolkien. You're teaching a class on Tolkien, and uh, as well, you also teach on C.S. Lewis. These are two beloved authors among, uh, among in, well, I was going to say among Christians, but no, um, pretty much the they're universally world. beloved <laughs> figures. And uh, it, it, there's a t point in their lives where Lewis is not yet a Christian and struggling to whether to become a Christian, and Tolkien sort of comes alongside him and helps him along. And I, I've heard this, and I, I've never read it myself in their letters or anything, or their accounts of it, but I've heard that Tolkien told Lewis that Christianity is the great story or the, the true myth. You know, to Lewis, Lewis loved mythical stories, fairy stories, and Tolkien said, look, all the great ones are modeled after the real story, and that's Jesus. Is that true? Yes, it is true. Yeah, the situation was this. By 1931, you know, Lewis was a young man in his 30s teaching at Oxford, where, where Tolkien was also a professor. And they had become very good friends. They'd been friends for five or six years by this time. And Lewis has been steadily moving from atheism towards towards a Christian faith. He's got to the point where he believes in God. He's going to church regularly. He's confessing his sins. He's praying. Uh, he believes the Gospels contain true history, that Jesus was indeed the Son of God, that he was born of a virgin. He died on the cross. He rose again. He's become persuaded of all these things. But he hasn't yet committed himself personally to Christ. And one evening, it was... I think September the 19th in 1931, Tolkien and Lewis and another friend, Hugo Dyson, are walking around the gardens and the colleges behind uh, the, co the gardens behind the colleges there uh, at Oxford University. And they talk till three o'clock in the morning, which is a very pleasant night. And Lewis asked a question, but this is my own reconstruction of, the, of, of what happened. But last year I came across some letters of Lewis to his friend Arthur Greaves, his closest friend all his life from when he was a teenager. He wrote hundreds and hundreds of letters to him. Every, every week of his life he wrote a couple of times. And Arthur Greaves destroyed many of the letters, the ones that were too personal, just out of respect for Lewis. But he kept quite a few of the letters about that time, about that situation. And I think this is, a, this is an accurate reconstruction of what happened. Lewis asked the question of Tolkien and Dyson. Now, I believe this is true, that Jesus was God's son, that he died and rose again, but I can't for the life of me understand what that has to do with me living 1,900 years yeah. later. You know, what impact can it have on me? What, what does it mean? And Tolkien's response was just a fascinating one. He said, now, Jack, Lewis, said, uh, you, you have loved fairy stories and myths ever since you were a little boy. Well, the, the gospel is just like a fairy story. It works in the same way. Uh, and Lewis's response was, how can you say that? Um, fairy stories and myths are lies. They're lies breathed through silver. The, those are the words he said. Now, if you ever say a line like that in your life, you'll think, I've said something or written something really beautiful. He said, their lies breathe through silver. What, what an amazing mm -hmm. thing to say on, 
you know, they're, they're, they're not true, but they're beautiful. And Tolkien's response was, no, they aren't lies. The reason you love them is because, yes, they're silver, they're beautiful, but they're beautiful because they are memories, they're reflections, they're echoes of the true story of Jesus. And the, he is, his story is the great fairy story, the great myth, because in Christ these stories became real you know, and they are all looking forward to him or they're all remembering him you know, he he is the true myth his story of his virgin birth his life of righteousness his death to bear our judgment and sins to defeat the devil his resurrection these are actual events in history and all these other stories are silver they're beautiful because they are reflections of this and you just need to respond to the story of Christ in the same way you respond to myths. Mm. And Lewis got it. And oh, less than two weeks later, he became a Christian. He was on his way to Whipsnade Zoo, riding in the sidecar of his brother Warren's motorbike. And uh, and it was in that motor, mo uh, riding on that motorbike in that sidecar that he became a believer. And and what Tolkien had said to him was. Uh, was really the thing that, that turned the corner for him. Mm. And a little later, Tolkien wrote a poem about that conversation and the poem called Mythopoeia, in which he addresses it to one who said that, that, that myths are lies breathed through silver. Uh, and he, he kind of poked fun at Lewis and said, he's a hater of myths. So from one who loved myths to one who hate myths. Well, of course, Lewis didn't hate myths at all, but, uh, so Tolkien was joking with him, but yeah, that was that was the, the thing that brought Lewis to faith. Wow! Wow! I've never heard that. <laughs> That's a great ever. story, and it, and and what a great way to encapsulate um, our conversation. That the Jesus, the great, the the, the true fairy story, uh, really did change the way we tell stories as human beings. I mean, it's just never been the same. It seems like that transition from B.C. to A.D. Uh, isn't just something that marks our calendars, it marks everything. Uh, stories have never been the same. That's right, they never have. And uh, Yeah, I mean, that's why, why, if you think about Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, what, what Tolkien is really trying to do, he's, he, he was very sad as a, as a teacher of Germanic languages, Anglo-Saxon, Icelandic, etc. He was very sad that the English had lost most of their legends. Uh, we don't have a body of myths like the Norse people do, for example. Those have disappeared. And so he said, well, my desire is to, is to write a body of myth for the English-speaking people. And that's what he does in The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and The Silmarillion. And one of the loveliest aspects of it is that every major character in The Lord of the Rings is a person whose life is like a prophecy in history of what Christ is going to come and do. Mm. So you've got Gandalf who lives his whole life as a servant with his glory veiled. He's actually a, 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 an angel who has been sent by Eru, by God, by Luvatar into this world to serve, to serve the peoples of, of Middle-earth. And he, he comes, he doesn't use his power ever for himself to parade his power to the world. He uses his power only to serve. And the climax of that, of course, is when he fights, he, he, he fights uh, whatever that the creature Balrog. is called. He's just escaped. <laughs> yeah. The Balrog, thank you. The Balrog there in Moria. And he plunges to his death. Uh, fighting the Balrog and sacrifices himself for his friends and then he is raised again from the dead and he appears to them in the forest of Fangorn transfigured it's just a beautiful beautiful picture of the transfiguration of Christ where his glory is is unveiled just briefly or when he's riding down uh, onto Helm's Deep it looks like Revelation 19 you know Christ riding on a white horse and mm. his enemies just fleeing before him and being overwhelmed and it's just very beautiful but his whole life is a life of service 
and self-sacrifice and it's the same with Aragorn who has lived generations as somebody who has hidden his glory who his calling to be the king is not being revealed he doesn't he doesn't long for power he, he gives himself to be a servant he mm. he serves as a ranger protecting the shire and constantly ready to give up his life for, for those he loves for those he serves and uh, eventually of course he, he becomes the king and his glory is revealed or Sam and Frodo are the same I mean they they are ready to, to lay their lives down in fact they think they, they have done mm. Uh, and much to their astonishment, uh, they wake up rescued by Gandalf and the eagles. But, but, but every character in the story is like this. Every character is a picture of what Jesus was going to do. And that really captures what Tolkien's understanding of myth was. It's an echo of the true story. So earlier we had no Jesus, no Harry Potter. Now we have no, no Jesus, Jesus, no yeah. Lord of the Rings. No Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Well, Jeremy, it's been such a pleasure to talk with you. I mean, we could probably go. I on could do for this 40. all day. I could do this actually. all day. <laughs> yeah, um, but it's been such a pleasure. Me too. I love to talk about these <laughs> things. So. Well, thank you for coming on our show and talking to us um, about uh, the incarnation of Jesus and how it affects story specifically. Um, is there um, is there anything you'd like to you'd like to pitch to people? I mean, obviously, we can send you everyone who's watching to Amazon to go buy his book. Yes, Echoes, Echoes of, of Eden. Eden. Are yes. you working on anything else by chance? I am indeed. Um, Lord willing, the, the seminary trustees will give me a final sabbatical next year. I'm going to turn 70 next October, So, but I don't plan to retire yet. But I have a sabbatical coming, and I've got several books I'm working on. One is a, a book on, uh, it's a series of studies on the book of Revelation mm. called Jesus, Lord of History. Mm. Uh, the hardest work I've ever done in my life, and I'm, I'm very excited about it. Um, and it's really trying to understand the book and apply it to our situation today. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not looking for contemporary equivalence metaphors, as I call them. I'm not looking for Viper, viper helicopters and <laughs> nuclear bombs and things like that. That's not what the Book of Revelation is about. You know, it, it's uh, it's about the challenges we all face in this world mm. uh, all the time, and our calling to follow Christ faithfully, to follow the Lamb wherever He goes. So uh, that's what I'm working on. I'm, I'm working on a book called The Heart of a Pastor, uh, what it means to be a pastor who's seeking to model one's life after, after the example of Christ, to actually be a servant of people. Uh, and I'm right, working on a book on worship called The Heart of Worship, looking at biblical principles of worship and applying those to our worship services in our churches and our own lives personally. And then I'm working on a book on Tolkien. Mm. Um, I haven't come up with a title yet, but uh, it will... Uh, because I just taught this class on Tolkien and we had so much fun, uh, I, I'm i going to... I'm working on a book on echoes of creation, echoes of the fall and the brokenness of our life, and echoes of redemption in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. So, uh, you're a busy wow. man. <laughs> so those, those are the things I'm working on. That sounds fantastic. Well, get out and pick up his book, Echoes of Eden, Reflections of Christianity and Literature in the Arts. Jerem Barr is professor of Covenant Theological Seminary. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. And to follow us on Facebook, Dead Reckoning TV on Twitter, at D Reckoning TV. I'm on Twitter at J Friesen, F-R-I-E-S-E-N. I'm at Brian G. Matson on Twitter, so follow me. Share us with your friends. Watch us on YouTube. Pick us up on deadreckoning.tv. I'm your host, Jay Friesen. And I'm Brian Matson. And this is Dead Reckoning.